surprises, guesses, imitation and misunderstanding. 300 years ago, in the period of Rococo art, what happened when the East and West communicated with each other for the very first time? These paintings, kept in the Louvre Museum, depict Western characters in Eastern-style backgrounds. These paintings in the Forbidden City are Western oil paintings. Chinese porcelain was placed in the Louvre. European clocks were found in bedrooms in the Forbidden City. At balls in the Louvre, kings and aristocrats dressed up like Chinese people. In this painting, the emperor wears a wig and dresses like a westerner. All this happened 300 years ago, when Eastern and Western people were fond of imitating one another. However, they didn't understand each other at all. They liked each other simply because they were surprised by each other's appearance and customs whenever they met. Gu Wenda is a modern avant-garde artist. He spends half the year in his studio in Shanghai and the other half in the US. When asked about intercultural communication, he showed us a chair. Half the chair is of European style, while the other half is of Chinese style. Gowen Gu Wenda says this chair represents his reflections upon cultures. Sitting in the chair, he thinks about cultural differences and conflicts. With strange feelings towards this chair, we went to the Louvre Museum and the Forbidden City to explore communication between these two cultures 300 years ago. In a bright room, there's a man wearing a wig, a woman with a beauty mark on her face, and cute-looking children. The family is seen taking coffee. The French artist Boucher produced this oil painting, Morning Coffee, in 1739, depicting French aristocrats' comfortable lives in the 18th century. You have, uh un, un décor excessivement euh, riche, cossu, 
Au XVIIIe siècle, euh, on donne une place très importante à la lumière et à l'espace. Et vous voyez ici que l'artiste a, a bien représenté ces grandes fenêtres d'où filtre la, la lumière qui éclaire un décor purement euh, rococo. This painting shows the fashions of Boucher's day. Objects in the shape of the letters C, S and a swirl, bright and relaxing colors, refined and elegant styles, themes of love and enjoyment. This kind of romantic style is called Rococo, which means the decorative art of shell-like curves. Rococo style was not only applied to paintings. In that period, the refined and elegant Rococo style could be found everywhere, in wooden items, crystal vessels, carpets, display boxes, and the dinner sets inside them, and in every room, from lobbies to bedrooms. In Boucher's painting, we also see that the dinner set is made of Chinese porcelain, and there are Chinese vases. More surprisingly, on the shelf against the wall, there's a Chinese statuette. Le goût de la chinoiserie commence donc euh, dans ces années 1700, 1710 et euh, cela va se poursuivre jusque dans les années 1750. Et, disons que le goût de la chinoiserie euh, s'intègre dans un goût plus large pour l'exotisme, mais c'est très euh, tout à fait intégré dans ce qu'on appelle le goût rococo. Why were Europeans so fond of Chinese styles in the 18th century? Were they interested in China for long, or was it a short-lived popular fashion? In the 13th century, Marco Polo came to China via the Silk Road. He then wrote The Travels of Marco Polo. In this travelogue, he described the rich cities and the comfortable life in China. He described Hangzhou as the richest city in the world. Every day, after finishing their work, the residents would take their wives and children and spend the rest of the day on the lake. Their lives were comfortable and happy. His book sparked Europeans' interest in the East, especially in China. Many adventurers and missionaries traveled to China. They gave an exaggerated account of China. China became a place where flowers bloomed and people all enjoyed rich and happy lives. In 1513, with the opening of a new route to the east, European merchant ships sailed to China. Silk, porcelain and tea were the most important commodities. Between 1600 and 1680, as many as 16 million porcelain objects were imported into Europe by the Dutch East India Company.
France was more interested in Chinese culture and art than any other European country. On the first New Year's Day of the 18th century, the French royal family held a costume party and everybody dressed up in Chinese outfits. This was the most popular type of costume at the time. The French royal family and upper class purchased a large amount of Chinese porcelain and lacquerware. The royal palace and aristocrats' houses were full of Chinese porcelain and ornaments. In his philosophical dictionary, Voltaire described China as an empire that was the best the world had ever seen. France was the fashion and art center of Europe at the time. Members of the European upper classes prided themselves on speaking French, and they kept up with France in terms of fashion. So the Chinese style quickly gained popularity in the rest of Europe. Western artists began to pay attention to the East and imagined it to be a truly heavenly place. Just as a Chinese statuette sat in a French aristocrat's house, European clocks were placed in Chinese emperor's bedrooms in the Forbidden City. In the Hall of Clocks and Watches, there are nearly 200 exquisite and well-made clocks that belonged to the emperors and the royal court. In the 18th century, clocks, which showed the advanced technology of the West, were Chinese emperors' favorite playthings. Clocks served as timekeepers and ornaments. Although these high-class playthings showed the advanced technology of the West, Chinese emperors deemed it an insignificant skill. They were brought to the Forbidden City by European missionaries. In 1584, an Italian Jesuit priest named Matteo Ricci came to China. He brought a world map with him. This map changed Chinese people's understanding of the world. They came to realize that China was just part of the world rather than the center of the world. After that, the Chinese emperors, who considered China to be the celestial empire, closed the door of the country. But in the meantime, they kept on paying attention to the other side of the world involuntarily. In 1688, King Louis XIV sent six French missionaries to China. They brought with them 30 scientific instruments and books. Emperor Kangxi accepted these extraordinary gifts. He decided that the six missionaries should stay in the palace and serve as his scientific advisors. Nine years later, he sent Joachim Bouvet back to France, taking over 300 volumes of books to present to King Louis XIV. Joaquin Bouvet also presented his biography of Emperor Kangxi to the king. Louis XIV was excited. He wrote an ebullient letter to the emperor, and he ordered Bouvet to prepare gifts worth tens of thousands of francs for Emperor Kangxi. In the letter, Louis XIV addressed Kangxi as the noblest, the most outstanding, the strongest, and the most gracious emperor and called himself a sincere, loving, and faithful friend. This letter showed his hope of understanding China. 
Although, in the end, it wasn't sent, but was stored in the archives of the royal court, it nevertheless is a witness to the first encounter between East and West. Three hundred years ago, when Emperor Kangxi and Louis XIV communicated for the first time, they were extremely curious about each other. Today, Gu Wenda, who calls himself an amphibian, may understand more about communication between the East and the West. In 2009, Gu Wenda held a great exhibition entitled Heavenly Lanterns in Brussels, Belgium. He used over 5,000 red lanterns to cover a large building. Guenda often says he is restrained by three limits. One of them is Chinese style, another is Western style, and the last is the combination of the two. He hopes he can break these three limits and create a new style. Over 200 years ago, another man also lived in two different cultures, just as Gu does. His name was Giuseppe Castiglione. Giuseppe Castiglione came to Beijing in 1715. Thereafter, he served as a court painter for 50 years, living through the reigns of three emperors, Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong. He adjusted his oil painting skills to cater to Chinese emperors, creating new skills that combined Western and Chinese painting elements. These skills spread among Chinese painters. This screen, named Chinese Maidens, was created by a Chinese court painter after learning oil painting skills. It's one of the earliest Chinese oil paintings in existence. The picture album of the old Summer Palace was painted during the reign of Emperor Qianlong. During the construction of the old Summer Palace in the early 18th century, Qianlong ordered Castiglione and French missionary Benoist Michel to construct a western complex within it. The retirement lodge is a unique residence in the Forbidden City. Western perspective techniques and Chinese decorative skills are combined perfectly in this building. In the four rooms in the western part, there are scenic illusion paintings covering 170 square meters, painted by Castiglione, which make reference to the ceiling frescoes and panoramas inside European churches. When Giuseppe Castiglione was trying to apply oil painting skills to traditional Chinese paintings, Boucher, the chief painter of the French court, was trying to add Chinese elements to his works. His works were very popular in France at that time. It takes two and a half hours to travel to Besançon in the east of France by train. This little-known city near Switzerland has an inextricable link with China.
1742, Boucher's works depicting China were exhibited at a salon, including the Chinese market, the Chinese garden, and Chinese fishermen. These oil paintings caused quite a sensation. A local factory produced tapestries with patterns of these paintings. These tapestries were quickly snapped up by aristocrats. Vous pouvez découvrir à travers le catalogue et à travers ces tableaux ces différents thèmes qui sont égrenés par Boucher, mêlant le pittoresque à, à ce qu'il connaissait et parfois à des modèles plus anciens liés à la gravure qui se superposent donc sur ces nouvelles images orientales. If you look closely at these Chinese themed paintings, you'll find that you're not so familiar with the China he depicted. The scenes in these paintings are typical Chinese scenes, like tea drinking, performances, rowing boats and fishing. Parasols, which Chinese people often use, also appear in the paintings. But palm trees, which are quite rare in China and Chinese art, appear in every one of these paintings. In Boucher's paintings, Chinese people always seem to live under palm trees. The people in the paintings look like Eurasians. Their clothes and hairstyles are also strange and quite different from those of Chinese people. Where did Boucher get these seemingly Chinese elements? As Boucher was depicting these fantasy Chinese scenes, one Chinese emperor asked his court painters to depict him as a European aristocrat hunting a tiger. In this painting, the emperor is dressed as a Persian warrior with a bow and arrow in hand. Then he becomes a Turkish prince receiving a peach from a monkey. And then a Taoist master summoning divine dragons. Then he becomes a fisherman by the river. But most of the time, he appears as a scholar of the Han ethnic group. This emperor seems to be performing at a costume party. As the only participant, he keeps changing his clothes and playing different roles from different countries. As Eastern emperors enjoyed the pleasure of Western art, Western aristocrats sat at home, appreciating the China depicted in Boucher's paintings. Yet, in his paintings, Chinese people looked Caucasian, and Chinese plants looked like tropical plants. Why did he depict China like this? Boucher was painting in a time of transition between art's Baroque and Rococo periods. Baroque art is thoroughly religious, and religious themes played a dominant role in Baroque works. During the reign of Louis XIV, this solemn Baroque art was incompatible with the lifestyles of the upper classes. Aristocrats gave themselves up to pleasure. This was part of the Sun King Louis XIV's strategy. To seize all the power for himself, he asked all the aristocrats to stay in the palace. He gave them money instead of power, so they had nothing to do but enjoy themselves and didn't care about politics. His strategy worked. The only thing the aristocrats were interested in was painting their faces, putting on wigs and reciting poetry. They were used to a luxurious, boring and mundane lifestyle. They wouldn't even put flowers out at home, because if they saw flowers withering away, 
they would feel their youth was disappearing, along with the flowers. This kind of lifestyle was pushed to an extreme by the powerful Marquise de Pompadour. She was the most famous of Louis XIV's many mistresses and was called the mother of Rococo. The bread, dishes, carriages, fans and cosmetics she loved were all extremely fashionable at that time. Amidst the Rococo fashion led by the Marquise de Pompadour, Boucher was able to get rid of the solemn religious painting style and focus instead on the theme of love. So in his paintings, the goddess falls in love, the female cook is flirting, and the shepherd is courting a woman instead of herding sheep. The people in his paintings are always reclining on something. They're happily in love, without any pressures or concerns. He spared no efforts in painting all this. In his paintings, Hercules kisses the queen. The goddess of love and the god of war gaze at each other. The goddess is resting after her bath, and a beautiful woman is dressing and doing her makeup. Boucher portrayed these beautiful naked bodies and the amorous scenes vividly and incisively. Boucher était appelé le peintre de la grâce, le peintre de la femme. Boucher représente un monde de bonheur, un monde sensuel en effet, un monde, un monde d'amour, avec toujours des, des, des corps euh, idéalisés, mais très, très gracieux dans la pose, et toujours des, des visages qui ont presque tous la même expression. Yet Boucher was not the first person to focus on men and women in love. The first person was Jean-Antoine Watteau, the pioneer of Rococo art. Pilgrimage to the Isle of Cythera is Watteau's best-known work. Et le sujet lui-même représente un paysage un peu idéalisé évoque donc la l'île de Citer, une île grecque euh, qui était l'île de Vénus. Donc dans le langage euh, galant de l'époque, aller à Citer, c'était faire l'amour. The three couples on the hill represent the three different stages in a relationship. Courting, acceptance and hesitation. At the foot of the hill, we see the couples in love, excited and ready to go to the Isle of Cythera. The people on the island look like well-trained actors and actresses, rather than ordinary people. They assume different poses and walk in a world of fantasy. It seems as though they're at a court ball where all the participants are dressed up and flirting. They lived empty and purposeless lives. So where was their fantasy paradise? Maybe the places they had visited were beautiful and exciting to them. They were certainly attracted to foreign lands. So Watteau, Boucher, and other Rococo artists focused on the fantasy of China. In Boucher's paintings, every Chinese man is handsome and gentle, and every Chinese woman is beautiful and charming. Their graceful behavior and theatrical postures seem familiar, don't they? As many scholars have pointed out, what Boucher painted was Louis XV's court rather than China. The men and women in his paintings were ministers and ladies dressed up as Chinese people. They lived in a dream world, 
and pushed elegance and beauty to the extreme. Donc on a l'impression d'être en Chine, mais on est dans une, dans une Chine fantasmée, ou en tout cas rêvée, en tout cas imaginaire. Donc là on est entre l'Orient et entre l'Orient et l'Occident, une sorte de, de collage, une sorte de rêverie, une sorte de mélange. Boucher never went to China during his lifetime. He got his inspiration from Chinese articles and from illustrations in books written by missionaries. He made the best use of these Chinese elements and his imagination and created these seemingly Chinese scenes. Palm trees and pineapple-shaped buildings often appeared in these pictures. In European culture, palm trees symbolize navigation and distant places. So in Boucher's paintings, palm trees are everywhere in China that distant and romantic country. Pineapple-shaped buildings appear in the paintings because Europeans had misunderstood Chinese towers. They thought Chinese towers were shaped like pineapples. So the buildings in these paintings are also shaped like pineapples. This kind of misunderstanding was a typical feature of Chinese elements in European art in the 18th century. The long distance, dangerous navigation and limited communication between East and West led to these misunderstandings. But a more important reason is that the people of these cultures misunderstood each other consciously and voluntarily they tended to interpret things according to their own wishes. Even if they knew the people and objects didn't really look like that, they still imagined it might be possible. This whole process was full of surprises, misunderstandings, conflicts, reflections, and relearning. Nowadays, this same process continues. Da tries to show the misunderstandings between Western and Eastern cultures in his works. When he was in America, he noticed that several poems of the Tang dynasty had been translated and included in books about Oriental culture. Yet the pronunciation and rhythm had been lost. So he had an idea. This is his great work, Forest of Stone Steels, retranslation and rewriting Tang poetry. On each stone steel is carved one ancient Chinese poem and its three translated versions. After translation, the original Chinese poems become obscure and strange. This the 
，歪耳野楼，立蛙壳，满诗度日，花的刻好词，泥耳者，魂师替卧，噩梦贪杀，三弟五，突猛腾思，啊，他踏轮，得自回路矣。是那么停红，细丝复目。Both Boucher, who lived in the 18th century, and Gu Wenda in our own time, show in their works that cultural misunderstandings can lead to unusual results. People add their imagination to this world, either consciously or unconsciously. In 1778, Boucher's student, Jean Honor Fragonard, painted The Bolt, pushing the extravagance and delicacy of Rococo art to an extreme. People liked to lose themselves in the extreme beauty of Rococo art, but it was to be their last dream before the empire fell apart, and they would be rudely awakened from their escapist fantasy. and Rome, launching a wave of classical paintings in France. The former was a master of Chinese painting. The latter was considered a father of French painting. What did they comprehend from their respective traditions? 